Good evening. My name is Jack Klieger. I'm president and CEO of the Museum of Jewish Heritage, Living Memorial of the Holocaust, and I'm honored to be here with you tonight to introduce Andrew Meyer and his new book, Morgenthau, Morgenthau, Power, Privilege, and the Rise of an American Dynasty. We're honored to have him with us tonight, um, uh, both Andrew himself and Sarah Morgenthau. He will be discussing his book with Sarah as we sit together in the Robert M. Morgenthau wing of the museum. Andrew Meyer is the author of Morgenthau, Power, Privilege, and the Rise of an American Dynasty. Former Moscow correspondent for time, he has contributed to the New York Times Magazine, among numerous other publications, for more than two decades. Sarah Morgenthau is the niece of legendary former Manhattan District Attorney Robert M. Morgenthau and the daughter of Henry Morgenthau III and Ruth Schechter Morgenthau, a Holocaust refugee who fled Vienna, Austria, on December 31st, 1938. An attorney and policy expert, Sarah Morgenthau recently ran for U.S. Congress in Rhode Island's second district. Before we get started, I would like to share a personal memory of Robert M. Morgenthau, founding chairman of the museum that we sit in tonight. It was 1999, at the time I was the newly named president of the company that published John Kennedy Jr.'s magazine named George. One month after I started, there was a plane crash and we had to plan a memorial service. One of the first people who called me was Robert M. Morgenthau offering to speak at John Kennedy's memorial service. And he spoke beautifully. He spoke sincerely. He spoke humbly. And it was then that I immediately understood what kind of man Robert Morgenthau was. I'm grateful to have been able to call him a friend. Tonight, we will learn more about the Morgenthau legacy. Let me bring up Andrew Meyer and Sarah Morgenthau. See us? I can't see a thing. <laughs> well, hi, Andrew. Hi. It's good to see you. Um, I, uh, I just wanted to say one or two things, can I? Of course. Okay. Um, you know, this book that, that Andrew Meyer wrote, um, he talks about the fact that it's not authorized um, by the family, but we're going to get into how he started this book. Um, I have now read it twice oh, in preparation. My goodness, my goodness. And it's pretty heavy. Uh, it's, a, you know, almost a thousand pages. But I can say that it's incredibly well written. And I think that at this moment in time, when we are dealing with anti-Semitism at an all-time high, when the dialogue about isolationism and globalization has been um, really sort of in the forefront of all of our minds in the uh, political system, when we're thinking about Ukraine and uh, humanitarian rights, the Holocaust, um, and sitting here and just how important it is that Andrew took this time, um, many, many years, which we will hear about, um, to write this really important um, history, which is, you know, about four generations, and it's about immigration, it's about uh, coming to America, it's about isolationism, it's about anti-Semitism, it's about standing up for what's right, it's about courage, uh, quest for, for power, and ultimately uh, uh, for public service, um, you know, in, a, in its purest form. And when I think about sort of all of those different themes, and we're sitting here uh, in this museum, which is so important and was so important uh, to my Uncle Bob, I think, too, that on December 31st, 1938, um, when... Um, my grandfather, Henry, was in the, uh, was the Secretary of Treasury to, to FDR. And I suppose you could say sort of at the highest, you know, pinnacle um, and proximity to power. Um, and so it sort of achieved that in a way. 
And my mother, um, Ruth Morgenthau, Ruth Schachter Morgenthau, was on a train, uh, December 31st, 1938, leaving Vienna, uh, betting on the Gestapo, uh, being drunk, um, and she did get out. But it just made me think about all of these sort of parallel universes and how important it is uh, really um, to take the time and uh, to do what, what, what Andrew has done. Um, so this is a tremendous book, and while it's long, the chapters are short, and he uh, has a really great way of, um, of describing some really, really important events. So Andrew, how did you start writing this book? First, first of all, I have to thank you for that incredible um, opening. And that, ladies and gentlemen, comes from someone who's actually not even in the book. So first of all, an apology. <laughs> 900 pages and uh, that incredible generosity and kindness. Um, and uh, and I, I think and hope it's all true. Uh, uh, your father, Henry III, many of you um, knew him, um, was really the first of, of several muses, opened the door literally to me. Um, he, of course, had written his own book, Mostly Morgenthau's, a fantastic book. And the very first time I called him, I was already sort of uh, on the job. Uh, I think it was the fall, or it must have been the summer of 2009, because I met your uncle, Robert Morgenthau, the district attorney, in the spring of 2008. Um, and it took me an awful long time to get my, sort of get my hands around the entirety of the story, the scope of the story, what it might be. And the first thing I did being a biographer but also a reporter was, okay, I had spent about six years chasing ghosts in the last book I did, and I wanted to find living people. And when I knocked on the door in Cambridge, Massachusetts, I found one of the most alive people you could ever imagine, uh, your father. And he opened the door, and in true fashion, like his kid brother, as he called him, he said, are you hungry? And there was... Uh, I think a four-course meal, very light, very nutritious, all fresh, heavy on the greens, um, and uh, a delicious meal. And there was a, a vetting going on, but it was a, such a genial, generous vetting. Um, because, as I said to him then, I wouldn't want anyone, a stranger, rooting around in my family, um, let alone when you had, he had also devoted many, many years and many, many drafts to his book. Uh, and then he took me to um, around the house and he showed me those drafts, dozens of boxes, so I knew what I was in for. And one of the very first things Henry did was uh, he came, uh, I, I went back, I saw him many, many times over the years in Cambridge and in Washington, and he gave me a set of letters that your father, as you mentioned, when he was Secretary of the Treasury, uh, he would dictate. Usually, dear boys, even though he had a daughter, Dr. Joan uh, Morgan, the dear boys, uh, typically it began last night, I saw the president, or this morning I saw the president, and here's what he said. And these are priceless letters uh, for many reasons, but first of all, because I could hear the voice. Henry Morgenthau, and we'll talk about it, um, the Secretary of Treasury, is in not hundreds, but thousands of books. And they're not inaccurate, they're not wrong, they're just incomplete. He's one of the great characters of the 20th century who's utterly misunderstood, in large part uh, at, because of his own fault. He didn't light, like the bright lights at all. He much preferred to be in the shadow of his son god, FDR. And there's the famous Morgenthau Diaries and all of that. But these letters, there was a different voice. There was a father talking to his sons. And it's an incredible, I mean, I mean, they really should be published on their own as a book. It's an incredible, with, with the enormous omission of Dr. Joan, uh, who was actually uh, at home for most of that time, when the boys were, and the boys, uh, Bob and Henry, were at war in World War II, both in Europe and in the Pacific. But that brought a different kind of voice and a relationship right away alive. And your father looked at me, he, he let me take them. He had made copies for me. And I said, are you sure? And he said, sure. And uh, you know, these are some of the most precious documents in that enormous cache of uh, uh, that store of boxes. 
And when I came back, he said, what did you think? And there was always a kind of generous rapport, uh, but he would be quizzing me. Uh, and that was really one of the most important points where I thought, there's a book here, I'm not sure I can do it, but there's an incredible story here that has yet to be told. So I want to bring you know, these four generations alive, but I want to touch on something which is, there was so much material. You know, there was over 900 um, uh, volumes, right, of, of just uh, the Secretary of Treasury Henry Morgenthau's diaries, right? I mean, I can't remember, but you know, millions and millions of words that you went through. Um, the blessing and the curse of the Morgenthau family is all that is written. How did you, uh, as, a, as a journalist, um, as a historian, decide what it was that you were going to focus on so that you could really tell this story? And then I want to really start to bring alive um, these four uh, sure. generations. So there are, I did a, a very quick uh, search when I was beginning it. Um, long story short, and uh, I'll begin at the beginning, um, I was... Uh, working on a magazine profile. I was then, I think as Jack said in his kind introduction, working for the New York Times Magazine, occasionally writing mostly on Russia. I had spent um, many years in Russia with Time Magazine. And for my, uh, when I was writing in New York, I was beginning to write more about New York politics. And lo and behold, Robert Morgenthau was still DA. <laughs> at, uh, at 89 and he was running for re-election. Uh, it was, he had a slogan, 90 and 09, I thought it was a pretty good slogan. And I went to see him one afternoon, as I said, in the DA's office that spring. And uh, I had tried to do my homework. I've known as being kind of thorough, obsessively thorough. And I had learned about the diary of um, uh, his great-grandfather, Lazarus Morgenthau. And I had read it at the New York Public Library in English and in, in uh, German. It was published by a relative in the 30s. And that kind of caught um, his eye. And he wasn't interested in a biography just of the DA. He wasn't going to write his own bio uh, biography, his autobiography. He famously said, it's the beginning of the book, I, spoiler alert, I never look back. Um, and with me, I gave him, I think, both the blessing and the burden, uh, which I think he enjoyed. <coughs> Lucinda Franks says, uh, late wife said, oh, he loves uh, talking to you. He, I became his look back to, his mirror, and I would see him very often. And that was his time, even though he was still working, he never really retired, uh, where he could look back. Um, he, of course, gave me tremendous shortcuts. It was not authorized. Many extraordinary things about this man as a subject, <coughs> excuse me, of a biography that he gave me unfettered access and he never asked to see one word. I read him, uh, especially the, the draft chapters uh, of the war we went over. Those were probably the ones closest to his heart. Um, and they were very, very difficult on many levels to do. Uh, but he never asked to see anything. Uh, and he never blocked my way. Um, so e enormous kindness and generosity, but also unfettered access. So there were, immediately I learned the the Roosevelt Library up in Hyde Park, fantastic place to work, has the, I think it's 890 volumes of the Morgenthau Diaries, 890 volumes. Now those are online. There's also the Presidential Diaries, which are also online, which is a separate uh, set of that. Um, they were not online when I first went up uh, to the Roosevelt Library. There's also, uh, so Lazarus Morgenthau is the patriarch who came here and. 1866. Yeah, let's, let's talk about Lazarus. You yeah. Know. So his papers. And Babette, and and their, you know, trip here, and their, you know, his cigar company, and the fact that you know he had made all this money, and then you know, unfortunately, with tariffs, you know, being implemented just before he arrived, um, ended up really losing it all. So. Let's bring a little color to, to, He's an to Lazarus. He's an amazing, I knew nothing about him when I started the project, um, other than what had been written uh, a little bit um, uh, um, uh, elsewhere. And uh, he was also misunderstood, um, and much of it remains to be discovered for the next person to come along. Both the first generation and I think the, the current generation uh, deserve their own histories. Uh, Lazarus comes, 
from uh, a very large, very poor Orthodox family um, in what is today southern Germany. And he really has an incredible uh, contrarian streak. He's an inventor. He breaks free of almost every single limit on his life, whether it be religion, whether it be class, whether it be uh, his economic standing. And he becomes, as you say, uh, an extraordinarily successful cigar baron. And at one point, owns one of the largest um, mansions in Mannheim, uh, uh, a picture which is in the book. And owns also and runs, uh, I think, four cigar factories, a thousand people working, making cigars to sell to his kid brother, Max, in San Francisco, to, of course, the 49ers. And the gold miners were buying uh, German cigars. Um, and so it was, it was a profitable business until, as you say, the Lincoln tariffs. According to his son, Henry Sr., who arrived right here at Castle Garden, 1866, just at the end after the Civil War, 10 years old, he says that the Lazarus' last shipment of cigars arrived just before the tariffs came, and they arrived at a dead loss. And so it is, you know, rags to riches to rags, not quite, but Lazarus never, he lives here for almost 30 years. And you can find him in memoirs of German Jews who lived in New York at the time, often not by name, not Lazarus Morgenthau, but by a gentleman sa sitting on a park bench wearing a Prince Albert, black Prince Albert, and a white cravat. That was his standard attire. And uh, he never spoke English well. He was always living on the margins, always in, in German Jewish society. But even in Mannheim, he had made these bridges, which is one of the themes throughout the generations and continues today right here in this museum. One of the, the, the former DA, uh, Robert Morgenthau, was very proud that, uh, with his friendship uh, with Cardinal O'Connor that um, school children, no matter their faith, would come through the museum. And as far as I know, that continues. Lazarus, actually, that's a tradition that goes all the way back to Lazarus in Germany. He gave money for the Catholic Church. He gave money uh, for the Presbyterian Church as well. And in New York, he never, he never really um, uh, finds his way. And I won't get into too much of the detail, but it's a very dramatic demise here. He ends up alone, eccentric uh, to the least. And perhaps as his son, the future ambassador to Armenia, said, uh, on the edge of criminality. Uh, the sheriffs come, they seize his furniture, he has a couple of wild schemes, all of which are fantastically inventive. There's a kind of genius there, um, and probably on the edge of criminality. And that's the patriarch. That's the patriarch, and then there's Henry Morgenthau Sr., which as you mentioned, the US ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, um, had an eye for real estate, um, for politics, Columbia Law School, um, made a bet on Wilson when, when others uh, weren't necessarily uh, so sure about it. But how did the influence, because I think this is what you do so well, Andrew, which is that this is not just about history, this is not just about service, this is not about some extraordinary individuals, but what you really bring out is the personal and, and how that impacts. And I know that Lazarus did have, I don't want to give too much away for those of you who haven't read the book yet, um, does have an unfortunate uh, ending as did his wife, Babette. But how, how did his father's influence um, shape sort of what he did, especially you know, when he uh, got to Constantinople and really witnessed some of the um, most horrible atrocities of the Armenian Genocide? Mm -hmm. No, it's, you know, thank you, first of all, for, for saying that. You're really getting it at the heart of what I aim to do. I'm not sure I succeeded as much as you're saying, but uh, that was certainly the aim, uh, to bring out the human and to try to bring these people alive, um, both the men and the women. The women uh, presented an even harder challenge we'll talk about. Um, the father and the sons among, among four generations, of course, it's the inevitable fathers and sons, um, competition, resistance, there's also a tremendous amount of inspiration, ingenuity. You mentioned it right now. Henry Sr., and your father said this to me, um, speaking of his grandfather, uh, was a great talent spotter, which is little understood, whether it be 
real estate, whether it be friends, Adolf Alks, the future uh, publisher of the New York Times, whether it be politicians, not just Woodrow Wilson, but F. Roosevelt, Franklin, in 1910, he spotted him. Now, Franklin Roosevelt was known, uh, but that's long before the norm, you know, the sort of the canon of um, Roosevelt biographers uh, put the Morgenthau-Roosevelt relationship. It was long before Dutchess County. Um, and, and yet, so each generation is fathers and sons, and yet it occurred to me, really, in speaking with the DA, one day we were talking and I was listening as I tried to listen. <laughs> he would say, would, you know, have I told you this, Andy, already? And I would learned, I learned early on say, yes, and I want to hear it again. Because every time he, he told a story, and as I'm sure many here know, he added another detail, out of modesty really, that he just forgot or didn't think it was important. And one of them was, I asked him about your father and this question of influence, inspiration versus resistance. And I realized that after the war, Bob Morgenthau had an incredible war. Tom Brokaw wanted to put him in his book, The Greatest Generation, and he was the DA, and he didn't think it was appropriate. But he certainly deserved uh, and deserves a place there. Um, and when he came back from the war, shell-shocked, which what he thought and Lucinda thought was probably undiagnosed PTSD, he went to Yale Law, graduated in record time. By his record, didn't learn much, uh, kind of glided and then went into private practice and then becomes a U.S. attorney and goes into politics, but always as a prosecutor. I said, did your father, dumb question, how did your father advise you? You know, he wasn't a political animal, but he always campaigned with Roosevelt since the 20s. He said, my father, why would I ask him? <laughs> and there's reasons for that. His father figure at that time, a man born in the same year as uh, Henry Morgenthau Jr. was the Republican uh, Judge Patterson, Judge Robert P. Patterson, who was sort of his professional father figure and a Republican. Um, but it also is the same with the Secretary of the Treasury. He didn't ask his father for advice, certainly not political advice. His father, Henry Sr., the ambassador, uh, the, the self-made millionaire, the real estate bundler, the political bundler, really one of the fathers of political bundling and real estate conglomeration. He built the man, and not only uh, built Times Square uh, and at one point owned the plaza and much of Wall Street, but also Upper Manhattan, Harlem, the Bronx. He, didn't, he remade New York City. Yeah, and you know, what you bring in too, which I think is so important, is while all of this was happening and you have the personal and you've got the quest for power and the quest for service, but we all have to remember the time that this was in with the great influx of, of immigrants coming into the city, uh, all kinds of people from all different walks of life, and, and his ability as a Jew when things were so, the anti-Semitism was, just it was the normal thing right so you know i mean even you know we'll go on next to to talk about um uh, henry morgenthau jr but you know even eleanor roosevelt uh, and the president and the president's mother um you know would would talk about you know uh jews in a way um that was not uh, so great um huh. so <laughs> just to say the least, although that changed, um, you know, remarkably, and that his, you know, his ability uh, to do that. So, um, you know, we, we have Henry Sr., um, and I think, you know, you've talked about, uh, you talk about in the book, and you and I have talked about how, you know, his being an immigrant, his, his uh, you know, really shaped his compassion, if you will, um, for what happened uh, in Constantinople and his willingness you know, to really raise his hand um, about right. that. No, absolutely right. And I do think you know, it's a question of historical forces versus family upbringing versus genetics. Um, he was a self-made man, and it sounds cliched, and, uh, at a, and my editor at one point said, this sounds, Henry Morgenthau Sr., he was never senior in life, he was Henry Morgenthau, sounds like either a Dickens character or a Horatio Alger character, he succeeds at everything he, he does, and it was extraordinary, almost each chapter is too much to believe, uh, coming out of the ashes, the ruins of his father, uh, Lazarus, literally. 
And yet, it's a truly American story. It's a New York story, and it's an American story. It's the immigrant story. And when you go through, I started to say, the, there's also another million pages of Henry Sr.'s uh, uh, papers at the Library of Congress, some up in Hyde Park at the FDR, but mostly in the Library of Congress. And when you go through those papers, you cannot be stunned, really in awe, of the man who is facing family ruin, He's worried about his mother, long-suffering Babette, uh, 14 children in 23 years, and that was not, that was the least of her worries, um, dealing with, let me say, erratic, eccentric, uh, abusive husband, who at one point is uh, sent away to an asylum. Um, and you go through these papers and you see extraordinary um, self-discipline. He's writing as an immigrant boy, um, trying to perfect his American cursive in public school in Brooklyn first and then New York City. And he's trying to, and I realized at one point, I, my eyes were blurry, it was actually on microfilm in the Library of Congress and they were like, you've got 20 minutes left. And I realized, why is he doing this? It was TH, TH, CH, TH, TH, just hundred, I'm not, you know, many, many pages, some of which I reproduced. Early OCD. He was trying to correct his German diphthongs. He was trying, to, which apparently he never, uh, um, there are sound recordings, he never lost his accent. Uh, it was anti-Semitism, but it was also anti-German, certainly during World War I, uh, for his son to be, to be a German in Dutchess County uh, and to be a German Jew even more so. So it's, it's this striving, incredible self-discipline. And then there's also this r wonderful American um, idealism. First with philosophy, he discovers um, Benjamin Franklin, and he literally tries the same thing, writing out a hundred ways I'm gonna perfect my, you know, it's human perfectibility. Uh, and then Emerson, the sublime, the ideal, the perfection, and, he's, and when he has children, and with his wife, Josie, he says, we should strive for the higher plane. Meanwhile, he's still making, trying to make money. And, and somehow, again, to your point, I would find letters to oh, everyone from Charles Crane, forgotten to history. Uh, there's, there's a couple of good books on Charles Crane. He was the plumbing, sewer, the sewer king of Chicago, uh, raving anti-Semite and pro-Hitler, actually saw Hitler in Germany, uh, I think in, in the early 30s. Um, and Henry is making common ground with Crane. Father Coughlin. You can Google the photograph with him uh, at a public rally. So uh, he was able not to put his head in the sand, but to really reach across and try to understand. And this is a theme that runs, as I said, through each generation. It, no, it truly does. It truly does. So let's go to the next one, uh, Henry Morgenthau Jr. Uh, incredible um, relationship with President Roosevelt. And I think I've said this to you before, Andrew, that I. I always knew that the Morgenthaus and the Roosevelts were close, but I didn't really understand the depth of their relationship. I mean, they traveled together, they ate together. Um, you know, my grandfather uh, carried uh, the president up the stairs, you know, after he lost the use of his legs um, from, from polio. He, uh, was dispatched, and I'll let you uh, sort of tell the stories often for, you know, special personal um, uh, 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 things that the president needed done and, you know, very important um, uh, but secretive, you know, sort of political needs too that he knew that he could really rely on him. Um, and I wouldn't be doing this uh, service if I didn't say that it was Henry Morgenthau Jr. and the president but the two Eleanors, um, my grandmother Eleanor Morgenthau and Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, who really did have um, an incredibly cro close relationship too, which in many ways I think encouraged um, and, um, and cemented, if you will, uh, the relationship between, between my grandfather uh, and, and the president. It's, you're absolutely right, and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that that's, that comes through in the book. Uh, again, it was your father. Uh, I feel his presence, and I'm reminded uh, as you speak uh, 
I asked him that question. We talked about the father's influence, and I realized, I said, wait, if the Treasury Secretary didn't listen to his father, he actually becomes a farmer because it was the one thing his father didn't know anything about. Uh, he didn't want to go into real estate. He didn't want to go into politics. He didn't want to go into Wall Street. Um, he had um, almost certainly undiagnosed dyslexia, so he couldn't read more on that later. He was terrible in school. Um, but I asked your father, if he didn't, if the Secretary of Treasury, his father, didn't listen to his father, who did he listen to his wife? <laughs> Your dad said, oh, my dad never made a move without consulting my mother. Right. And Eleanor Morgenthau deserves her own book. One of the great delights was when also uh, in the archive, I'm going through pages and pages of the Morgenthau diaries, and I would see little scribblings. And I got to, you get to know handwriting. You start reading. Stacey Schiff calls it interrogating what's not there. And you start reading and you realize, wait a minute, something's different here, different handwriting. And these were edits. And the Treasury Secretary could read. He may have been, probably was dyslexic. Um, and he was absolutely suspicious and thorough in any speech he was going to make. He was going to make, read it carefully and make amendments, redactions. But this was a different handwriting. And I realized, this is a speech. These are notes for a speech. These are his impromptu speech. I tracked it down. It took a long time. 1924, 1925, 1926, upstate New York, Republican, rock rib Republican country, dairy farmers. It's not Henry Morgenthau Jr. speaking. It's not FDR. It's not ER, Mrs. Roosevelt. It's Eleanor Morgenthau making speeches to ladies Democratic clubs. It's unknown history and it's absolutely fascinating because yeah, it, it, it so it, she sounds like Hillary Clinton or Elizabeth Warren. She's got gusto. She had graduated Vassar, I think it was 1909. Eleanor Roosevelt had not. It's one of the things that bound them. Eleanor was, old, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt was older. Uh, Franklin, FDR called them the two Eleanors. They're spelled differently. Um, and uh, they were extremely close, extremely close. And so she had, uh, Ellie, as, as he called her, and as I call her in the book, had gone to Vassar, had been the head of the, uh, the Dramatics Club, had a natural way of speaking, and she had taught acting at, right here at Henry Street Settlement. Um, she was gifted in many, many ways. She was a great linguist, musician, many ways that her husband was not. He was famously a terrible speaker, absolutely shy, suspicious of everyone, didn't want to be in the limelight, a hand wringer. And FDR loved that Ellie could get Henry's goat. You know, he called his very, very close friend, Henry Morgan, the Henry the Morgue. Right. Why are you so glowering? You know, why, you know, and he loved uh, to poke fun at him. They had a great bromance. Um, and uh, Jeff Ward, Jeffrey Ward, who's written uh, several books on FDR and the Roosevelts, says he read those chapters, to really sort of the heart of the book, the fulcrum of the book, and he said, you know, I think you've done something that we haven't seen is exactly what you said, this quadrilineal relationship. The Roosevelts on their own had probably the most complicated and most bizarre and yet most efficient political marriage in American history <laughs> that we've seen. Um, and this, this relationship, quadrilineal, they're the only couple that, as you said, they traveled with, not just upstate, but to Florida, they were on the host houseboat when Roosevelt was stricken with polio. Very few people came in to see him in bed. They did, Ellie and Henry. They were very, very close, as early as 1914, almost two decades before the White House, throughout Albany. And it's not just a personal relationship. Yes, the famous line was Henry Wallace, who becomes Secretary of Agriculture, said, oh, Morgan, the, he was the guy, you know, the loyalist, the vassal, the bootlicker. He was the guy that always got FDR's bootleg liquor, which is true. Right. He did. And FDR liked to mix uh, the cocktails through prohibition. But as you alluded to, he did so much more, whether it was going off gold, the beginning of, uh, of it all, or whether it was making the overture to the Soviets, Right. 1933, we had not recognized the Soviet Union yet. Extremely risky. And here's this hand wringer, doesn't want to be in the limelight, being sent out time and time again. And of course, the big one was rearming Western Europe, right. France and England, which as early as 1933, 
when Hitler rises to power at the same great you know, coincidence of history at the same time FDR rises, there's a note they scribbled to each other. Your grandfather was always on the right in cabinet, always literally his right-hand man to FDR, always the only member of the cabinet, the only Jewish member, but more importantly, the only member to have lunch every Monday with FDR. That's part of the presidential diaries. And he scribbles a note to the president and says, 1933, trouble in your Germany. Do you think there will be war? And FDR writes back, yes, most probably. And will we have to go in? Yes, to aid France and England. So already in 33, they're thinking about rearming in contravention of the current yeah, laws. This is important, um, Andrew, because it's, again, the theme that I think that you draw out so well in this, which is that it's important to understand when we understand history that there were some things, and we can talk briefly before we go to Robert about the War Refugee Board, about you know the sort of early war production and lend lease, but that my grandfather Henry Morgenthau Jr. used his personal relationship um, because there was that closeness. It was the only way that in this very um, you know, complicated time in our history with what was going on in Europe with deep anti-Semitism, deep isolationism, the Poles all saying uh, to the president uh, that, that he shouldn't get involved. Uh, you know, Henry Morgenthau used that personal closeness um, and that access, uh, and he knew sort of, you know, how, how the president ticked um, to get some really important messages. So let's talk about that briefly. Absolutely, absolutely right, and it is, so resonant today when I'm giving talks on the book and the question comes up first and foremost, often, unfortunately, about anti-Semitism. Obviously, this book took more than a decade to write. When I was writing it, I thought it was history. And then about Ukraine and American power and America's role and mor America's moral right and moral authority. And it really is the theme of the book. I mean, public service, what does that mean? Uh, fantastic historian, many here know Henry um, Feingold says that, well, public service is really entering for the Morgenthaus, for really for the ambassador. You know, you make a lot of money in real estate, you go into politics, you're entering the political class. That's partly true, but not entirely true. And I hope it's clear in the book that for Henry Sr., he says, it's really the epigram to the book, I didn't have to wait. I made my money by 55. And he tells young Robert, and I'm sure he also told your father, uh, you don't have to wait. It's a privilege, and that's the sense of privilege. It's the privilege to serve, and really, it sounds corny, to do the right thing, to stand up for when, and it goes back to that young boy, the immigrant boy, um, for doing the right thing in the face of resistance and defiance. Uh, and I hope that's a thing that, can, that really comes through. So to the War Refugee Board. Yeah, it no, absolutely does. Yeah, go to ahead. To the War Refugee Board, I can't help but think, you know, today, uh, the ambassador, um, to, to be telegraphic, but uh, true to the history, uh, said that he bought uh, the Democratic Party uh, for Woodrow Wilson, who had only had one term as New Jersey governor. And it was a, it was a bet. He was a talent spotter. Uh, he said it was 20,000, it was probably more than that. He was a bundler. And as a reward, he gets, quote unquote, the Jewish seat. Oscar Strauss had had it actually three times before, I think, uh, the, to, the, to Constantinople, what was known as the Sublime Port. He's there, he didn't want to be there, and he finds himself, of course, literally on the edge of the knife, of the knife point of history. Beginning of World War I, and the Armenian Genocide. Genocide didn't exist, the word didn't exist. He writes home and he says, the destruction of, of, of uh, an entire race, the extermination of an entire race is happening. Secretary of State gives the reports that Ambassador Morgenthau is getting, not only from his 13 consulates across uh, the Ottoman Empire, but also from, again, the bridge, the American businessmen who were there and Clergymen, missionaries, nuns, one of the most harrowing reports is uh, a Swedish nun's report, Alma Johansson. And she goes and sees Henry Morgenthau, as he was the man to see in New York, right. if you wanted to get anything done, back to Adolf Fox, or you wanted to be elected mayor, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, or if you wanted to um, find out where the subway was gonna go, uh, 
uh, you went to go see Henry Morgan. The same thing in Constantinople. He, I think, takes over nine, if at least nine different affairs of different um, countries during the war. He becomes the center, even though he's still the outsider. In letters and in his diaries, he writes as the young immigrant boy, if you could see me now, it's almost a quote, I'm paraphrasing, how far I've come. And he's writing to himself, because now he really is among real aristocrats, real nobility. And he, for a while, he's alone without his wife, and he's worried about, will I make a fool of myself? I don't speak you know, French like they do. Uh, will I use, literally he writes about, will I you know, be able to get through these fancy dinners? And of course, he quit, acquits himself very well. The Armenian deportations first happen on April 24th, 1915. He's having dinner with Talat, one of the young Turks, right. in the American embassy the night of the deportation. All of that is to say, his protests fall on death, deaf ears. And to your point, when did we recognize, as the United States government, the Armenian genocide? Joseph Biden, right. 2021. A hundred, took 107 years. Yeah, and, and and we know, you know, because I want to to move to the to the next generation and to to Robert, you know, who um, is uh, so well known here in this building, and and really in many ways uh, how you started this book, because I know that you know you you went to meet him. Um, I think it was in 2008, if I have that correct, um, and 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 started what you thought would just be maybe a short article, and then <laughs> ended up with the, with with this a thousand pages. Um, but to to reflect back on on the Secretary of Treasury and the War Refugee Board, I know you write about it in the book. But the you know he was there with his father in Constantinople. I don't know why I keep Trump uh, stumbling over that um, uh, uh, word. Um, and that that really informed uh, my grandfather, you know, when, and, and made him to be able to really see that it was important uh, to have to stand up for this, but that it took a long time. Um, you know, some say uh, too little, too late, but I think he did uh, get that information uh, to the president. Again, in a deeply, deeply uh, anti-Semitic, uh, isolationist time, with a State Department that was truly blocking uh, right. all access to the pre president, stopping the visas um, from um, allowing um, the European Jews to come into the country. So, um, absolutely, absolutely right. And 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 not just anti anti-Semitic, old line patrician, was State Department, really rigid in its bureaucracy. And in many ways, Henry Morgenthau was the antithesis of that, not just by his background, but really by his nature. He was, I mentioned dyslexia, he was a visionary. He was an incredible bureaucrat, capital B, new, he wasn't a new dealer in terms of his economics. He, he hated the tax increases. He hated the spending. He was literally worried and keeping track, not only of what was going on at the farm each day, but also what was going on, although he was presiding and, and created the largest budgets in history. Uh, to fund perhaps, the, perhaps he saw something about what we're dealing with today. <laughs> exactly. And, and oversaw round after round of crisis. war bonds. Yeah. I think it was $49 billion in war bonds for the war effort. Um, but there were two things about Armenia. And looking at the diaries and looking at his notes and his letters, um, which are uh, often stenographic meetings, each morning he met with his staff in the Treasury. Finally, when the the Riegner cable, the infamous Gerhard Riegner cable comes, and the truth and the, the reports and the leaks are coming from Europe. In the summer of 1944, Henry can, uh, the Secretary of Treasury, can wait no more. And I'm thinking, surely he must recall, he had visited um, his father in Constantinople three times. He had gone to the trenches, again, with the Germans. He had celebrated, actually, uh, New Year's Eve with German officers. They had toasted the Kaiser. Talk about uncomfortable. Um, and he writes that in his diary. And it was part of this sort of, um, not obsession, but conviction that he shared with his father that Germany is going to be a problem. Becomes the title of his book, Germany's Are a Problem. And I'm waiting for him as I'm looking at the steno stenographic record of these meetings every morning with his staff. And finally, he says it in the summer of 44. And uh, he, says, he says, my father was there in Constantinople. Uh, I remember what happened to the Armenians, and I remember the silence 
that his cables talking about mass murder were met with in Washington. And he says, boys, they were all boys, uh, bygone. And then he really lights in. I, don't, I know the president, and I'm going to stick it to him. Now, of course, he did one thing, as you mentioned earlier. He would always go, almost always, to Mrs. Roosevelt first, sound her out. Right. How is Franklin? Right. Is he crotchety today? Roosevelt, of course, was, uh, was waning his strength. And she would say it was at this time what the Secretary of Treasury later called those terrible 18 months from when he found out about the truth of the Holocaust, the extermination, the final solution, long after the Vanze conference, up until the, the, the founding of the War Refugee Board, he called those, my, those terrible 18 months. That's when Eleanor Roosevelt said, Henry, you're Franklin's conscience. He listens to you. And uh, I think she was right. I think you, I, they kidded each other. Uh, they did have this wonderful rapport. But that's really what you talk about leveraging FDR didn't need the report. He knew that this, the time had come. It was too little too late. Uh, but for, for the Treasury Secretary, it, it was the height of his power. No, it, it truly was. It truly was. So let's go to Robert Morgenthau. And um, I think there's a few things we want to talk about. We want to talk about maybe his time in the Navy and how that influenced him, some of his near-death experiences his relationship um, with Robert Kennedy, uh, who was the Attorney General, as you know, when his brother uh, was president. And then uh, uh, Bob, my uncle Bob, uh, became uh, the US Attorney in the Southern District. And we can't, talk, we can't not talk about your really excellent um, uh, history and treaties, if you will, um, on uh, the start of white collar crime, insider trading. He started the first securities fraud uh, unit at the at the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, and his quest, uh, along with Bobby Kennedy, um, for the mob, for the mafia, and um, which then continued uh, when he was in uh, the Manhattan DA's office. And that's all before he became DA. And that was all became before he became DA, yeah. yeah and then just some funny stories. I, don't, I can't see who's here and who's listening on, but I know um, that there are uh, so many um, uh, uh, that my uncle has touched, uh, especially um, in the legal um, uh, uh, space. And, you know, just these funny little anecdotes, Andrew, that you give where, you know, Arthur Lyman, uh, the legend, you know, when he brought him over to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and he said to my uncle, you know, I didn't, you know, read anything about, you know, security statutes when I was in law school. Uh, and my uncle looked at him with those who know him uh, it, and just his deadpan and said, neither did the crooks. Neither did the crooks, exactly. <laughs> yeah, um, I learned early on, I think it was uh, uh, his great friend and former um, assistant in those years, the U.S. Attorney years, uh, Judge Pierre Laval said, uh, you know what you're in for, Andrew, he, I think he said to me, the people, the list, the shortest book in the world is the list of people who've been able to say no to Robert Morgenthau. Right. And I think this, I know this uh, building, this museum is testament to that. Um, and that was one of the Arthur Lyman story was one of his favorite stories. Uh, and I checked it out. Uh, um, there were uh, interviews with Arthur Lyman at the JFK library that I found. Um, but unfortunately, he left us too early. I wasn't able to interview uh, Lyman. But uh, it's an incredible, you know, while I was writing this, uh, a very well-known uh, writer, I won't mention him by name, got in touch with me and he said, are you doing anything on the U.S. attorney years? Because I want to do a book on that. At that point, I was about six years in. <laughs> and, and I had interviewed every single uh, living um, veteran of that office, the Southern District, the Sovereign District, uh, I, I call it there, in, as it was known under um, Morgenthau. Uh, it was almost a decade, one of the longest tenures, in, argu inarguably the most important district in the United States. And he not only changed, I didn't go to law school, uh, another thing I think he liked uh, about his would-be biographer, uh, he's not a lawyer. Um, and uh, I learned early on that it wasn't just uh, 
the reforms and the pioneering strategies he employed in the Southern District under Bobby Kennedy, as you said, and then uh, under or around, more accurately, LBJ. Uh, the two did not get along in any way, and J. Edgar Hoover is another whole matter. Um, but how he redefined his district in New York to be the entire globe really changed as well federal, federal prosecution across the whole country. And that's a book actually that you know, needs to be written uh, because uh, early on, uh, another late great who left us uh, too early, Peter Fleming, um, said to me, he very, very tall, those of you who knew Peter, was a very tall guy, lovely man, brilliant, and he said, you're the luckiest guy in the world if you're gonna write about the US attorney years because there are so many great stories and so many great characters, uh, which is true, and I did have a lot of fun with it. And many of them are there. Louis Wolfson, uh, the Junk King, um, Roy Cohn, uh, not all winning cases. Uh, right, he, but, he, he, but, he wanted Roy Cohn so, Roy Cohn so badly. But, but these you know, are pioneering yeah. cases in the way he strategized and the way he implemented the law and in the way he inspired young, uh, mostly men, uh, Pat Hines, one of the few women, uh, very few, but there were African-American uh, prosecutors as well. Um, and Peter Fleming said, you're the luckiest guy in the world, but if you screw up, we know how to find you. Uh, <laughs> and I certainly <laughs> remembered those words. Uh, so it's a, it's a pioneering time. Um, and it really, to get back to your earlier question, the Navy in the war, he, uh, his ship was sunk in the med when he was a young executive officer, number two in command, 23, 24 years old, 49 men died that night, two of whom he buried. And he wrote letters to the families. He also put black messmen, the only rank allowed black Americans in the Navy, he put them on the guns, both in the med, and then five months later, after losing a ship and 49 men, he goes on a new ship into the Pacific to Okinawa, to Iwo Jima. Some of the same men, including those black mess men who are now gunners, are with him. They volunteered, they wanted to be with him. He's 23, 24 years old, married, comes home, and meets his first child, who was born while he was at sea. It's an extraordinary war. He finds out that FDR, who was something like a very, very close uncle to him, dies while he's in the Pacific. Um, he comes home and he is, as I said earlier, dazed, he's shell-shocked. I said, I would ask him this all the time, what do you remember? And he would just sort of shrug and say, nothing. He slept, he was exhausted. He never slept for more than a half an hour, an hour at a time when he was at sea. It's 54 months, 54 months at sea. It's unimaginable what, as a young man. Uh, but more importantly, the lessons he learned, which I think really only he was sort of gathering as we were talking and I was writing, the lessons of the war were really about, again, it sounds corny, leadership, management, America. He brought men who had come from all walks of life to one common purpose at battle. His father, I would interview these guys and many of them have, we've lost uh, from the, all the ships he served on. And I said, wait a minute, you were 18, 19 years old, you had a high school degree, and your exec commander is the son of the Secretary of the Treasury. Are you telling me you didn't expect special treatment? We knew his dad was sitting with FDR. Didn't make a bit of difference. We trusted him. We knew he was gonna do what he said he was gonna do, and no less. And that really, if anyone knows anyone from the DA's office, they would say the exact same thing. Right. Uh, and that really is leadership. Get good people. Let them do their job, and don't get in the way. Uh, you know, I'm glad you're saying that, and you know, to give a, another little flavor, and then I wanna move to a, another really important case that I think a lot of us will remember, but uh, Elliot Spitzer, um, the, the uh, renowned governor and attorney general, uh, was working for Arthur Lyman, this was later, and you tell this story, and uh, Spitzer was, you know, fresh out of Harvard Law School, just a little bit ambitious, uh, getting a little bored uh, at Paul Weiss, 
and uh, I guess confided in Arthur Lyman, who said, at this point, uh, my uncle was uh, working at the DA's office, or what, was the district attorney, and he said, go work for Morgenthau. Um, and then, you know, they had uh, quite a lot of fun together. But one case that, you know, you and I talked about before um, is the Central Park Jogger case. And I know you talked to my, my uncle about that extensively. Uh, and I know that that weighed uh, he heavily on him. And I just thought, you know, uh, what, what did you um, sort of take away from that? I know how, um, how complicated that was. And, and I, myself, as I was reading this um, and, and thinking through all of this, and as a lawyer myself, um, you know, where did, where did the, you know, the obligation, where did the fault uh, end up uh, lying? Uh, because, you know, it was a really, really difficult time that took some new times, some things that we're dealing with, you know, today um, to, to really uh, make sure that justice was done. Yeah, it, you know, we mentioned how I first met him and he wasn't interested in a biography just on himself. He really was interested in the grand arc of history, what we call the grand suite, the grand, the long arm. 150 years of American history, world history, four generations, his mother's contribution, his wife's contribution. Martha Morgan, his first wife, was eight and a half months pregnant when she flew in a, in a snowstorm up to Buffalo when he was running uh, for governor in 1962. Failed campaign, but not as bad as the second time he ran in 1970. And so he really wanted the long sweep of the family's contribution. And inevitably, he understood as well, but again, he never dictated which cases we would look at in 35 years as DA and another nine, nine and a half as U.S. Attorney. And I settled on, after doing hundreds and hundreds of interviews, not only with his former assistants, his present assistants, but with critics, if you could find critics, who would talk on the record. Um, and I did my best uh, to do so. And, and they existed and they exist. And the Jogger case was one of the very first things he talked to me about uh, when we first met. He talked, we talked about the Patriarch, Lazarus. We talked about the War Refugee Board. We talked about Bernie Getz. And we talked about the Jogger case. Right. And it definitely weighed on him. In a way that was quite serious, that he knew uh, that when he retired and there were a wave of articles, it would be front and center. And he knew it would be part of his legacy. And when I spoke to critics, I don't think you can call them rivals, because he certainly didn't consider anyone a rival. And although he uh, ran and won nine times, there was really only one competitive race. Um, his rivals actually gave him due. Uh, this was the case, and I was always trying to sound people out. If you were to write a book just on the DA years, 35 years, what are five or six cases you would focus on? I didn't want to do the headlines. I knew that early on. I wasn't going to do sensational, like John Lennon's murder or murder at the Met. I wasn't going to do the big tabloid cases. I wanted to do the cases that were illustrative of what Robert Morgenthau as DA stood for. How was he innovative? How was this kind of leadership the forward thinking, the legal mind. How did he push the boundaries as DA, just as he had done as US attorney, so that every district attorney in the United States would work differently? And the Jogger case certainly is emblematic of that. And I actually see it as a positive. And it was Barry Sheck, the founder of the Innocence Project, right. who I was deep along and I was keeping an open mind and doing hundreds of interviews on this case. Um, and for those of you who don't remember, the details are extensive. Uh, and as one of the people who's been involved with the case, at the heart of the case, since its inception says, don't go there, nobody comes out <laughs> better or healthy or, or sane, um, which is true, which I think is true. And people still obsess on this for very good reasons. It's an ex extremely important case in the history of New York City and the country. It was Barry Sheck, the founder of the Innocent Project, 
who has done more for DNA exoneration or as much as anyone alive, he said to me, and he was, the DA was no fan of Barry Shack. Barry said, I'm so glad you're doing this book, and I'm so glad you're looking at the long arc, as I said, of history, because too often it's forgotten that Morgenthau was DA when the Jogger case happened in 89. He was also the DA when Matthias Reyes comes forward, the lone rapist and serial killer and killer who says, I did it and I did it alone. Right. And it was Schecht who said, that's Morgenthau as DA's, it's not his worst sin, it's his shining moment. And because only a man, which is the same thing that many, many people on other cases, other matters, political corruption, you know, he went after Democrats, Jews, uh, old family members, he did not care. This is Robert Morgenthau. Barry Sheck said the same thing. Only someone with his family, the confidence of his roots, of his father, his grandfather, could have the integrity and really the backbone to do the right thing when he knew that, first of all, the police department, the PD, is going to be in uproar. He admired Ray Kelly. They got along. They were friends uh, in after this. But there was a huge rupture, much of it's on the public record, between the PD, the police department, and the DA's office. And then even within his own DA's office, to this day, the Jogger case divides the DA's office through 12 years of his successor, Cy Vance, and now under uh, Alvin Bragg's. Um, administration, the Jogger case still divides it, and it's not over yet. And as Cy Vance said to me, it's the case that will never go away. Right. And maybe it shouldn't. So on that really sort of uplifting and positive note, um, and I could sit here and talk with Andrew uh, all night, and in fact, he and I did a, an event together uh, in Jamestown, Rhode Island, and then ended up going for dinner and literally talking all night um, because... I want to hear it, some questions, it, though, but this is... Because <laughs> it's been just amazing, but I do encourage everybody to read this book uh, for, for so many reasons. But I wanted to give some time um, for um, folks in the audience uh, to ask you some questions. Absolutely. Do we have time for a few questions? Yeah. Oh, good. We can see people now. Your hand will come to you. How are you? I, I, it's less of a question and more of a welcome to the museum. And I hope I, we're going to be close after this, but I hope, as Andrew said, the Regner telegram is on the second floor mm. of our the Holocaust, what he can do, as well as information about the War Refugee Board and what America did and didn't do. Um, during the war, which really ties into the legacy of the building that you're in. So, thanks. I hope that you come back. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. That's Josh Mack, our VP of Marketing. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Thank you. Keep it going, Josh. Uh, would you talk a little bit about Senior's relationship with the other uh, powerful Jews of his era, Brandeis or Baruch or any of the others that might have been around? So it's a great question, um, and it's a little bit what we talked about before, the immigrant child always feeling a little bit of an outsider with a huge chip on the shoulder. Um, whether it was Brandeis or more importantly with Felix Frankfurter or with uh, 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 Baruch, uh, he was well aware he didn't have the intellectual firepower of some of those guys. He also didn't have the money of someone like Berg. Um, but he absolutely was in the same league and wanted to be, first of all, he wanted to have the job that his son got. He wanted to be Secretary of Treasury um, under Wilson's uh, first administration. And he felt that he didn't, it's what, what I alluded to when I said he didn't want the Jewish seat. It wasn't just that it was anti-Semitic. It was that he didn't want to be a mere ambassador in little, you know, little hindsight of history. Uh, he didn't, little did he know that you know, he would be right at the right place at the right time. Um, but he did not have, before 1912 and before 1915, before the Armenian Genocide, he didn't have the moral authority that he did afterwards. 
when he became Ambassador Morgenthau. He did uh, completely, time was short, didn't completely skipped over that. He helped found with the great rabbi Stephen Weiss the Free Synagogue for many, many fascinating reasons, bringing together many streams of uh, American philosophical and spiritual yearnings. He also did a lot in terms of settlement life, in terms of trying to better the immigrant uh, standards of living and earnings, both in le on legislation and in Albany, as well as serving um, even before the, the shirtwaist factory uh, fire on the board of hygiene. He held a public office at the beginning of sort of the sense of uh, progressive public service um, in a way that distinguished himself from some of those people, not everyone. Um, of that crowd, he was probably closest to um, the Strausses. Uh, and he certainly looked up to Oscar Strauss, the man whose seat he would take over in Constantinople. Um, there was tremendous competition though, Otto Kahn, tremendous competition in the realm, which I only think have one chapter on. I wrote much more on this. It was something that your father wrote a lot about as well. Henry Morgenthau, after making his money, then moved into the arts. And he helped rebuild the Metropolitan Opera House, both physically and in terms of its repertoire. Staged Wagner for the first time. That was putting himself on the map in the social 100, uh, it was also competing with people like Otto Kahn, and in that case, failing. Um, but it wasn't just the R crowd, German Jews, it was everyone. It was the Whitney's, the Vanderbilt's, the Astor's. Uh, Henry Morgenthau took on everyone, um, but always a little bit to the side of center stage. Uh, always a little bit to the side of center stage. And similarly, his son, especially when it, come, when it came to Baruch, was very careful to distance himself from the rivals of his father. I'm being elliptical, but that's, but that's a fascinating story. That FDR always would try to say, well, Henry, your dad, you know, your, your, your papa knows this guy. And Henry Jr. would say, uh, not so fast uh, because of these animals. And it's a long story, which is in the book, with Felix Frankfurter, who had nothing good to say about Henry Sr., uh, calls him a blowhard, uh, tooting his own horn, uh, idealist to the extreme, fanciful ideas about making a separate peace um, with Turkey. Uh, there's the failed mission to Gibraltar. Um, and so the animosity there only grew. But it's a great question. Thank you. A couple more questions. Christopher? <laughs> You're excused. <laughs> on page 242, um, you mentioned that, um, you mentioned that um, f I think his name is Father Coughlin, who's a very controversial figure in American history and so on. And he actually uh, rents Carnegie Hall for a meeting. And I just, I wondered if you, knew about that or whether you and just glossed over because you had so much else to tell us or whether you were aware of the fact that Carnegie Hall was actually owned by his nephew and then um, you know the successor you mentioned in the, in the footnotes and carry on which is Robert E. Simon Jr. who creates Rest in Virginia and so on and so forth so I just thought you might explore that Fashion. and also at the so time that that all occurs um, his um, Henry Morgenthau's daughter who's Ruth Morgenthau ends up marrying George Nomberg, which is not mentioned in the book at all, but the Nomberg family is very involved in musical history in New York, and Elkin is very friendly with Carnegie, and starts the Oratorio Society in their house, which ends up leading to the building of Carnegie Hall, and so on and so forth. So I just thought it was odd that he permitted this construction to take place um, uh, and be utilized by somebody who was so antagonistic to Jews and to the Morgenthau family. Fascinating. Yeah, um, I was lucky uh, enough to spend two days with George Nomberg, um, uh, interviewing him, and um, we did not talk about Father Coughlin, no. Um, and it's fascinating. I wonder, so was Carnegie Hall at that point owned, you said his, 
I, I didn't catch the pronoun. Who was his, at that time when Coughlin, who, or oh, Robert E. Simon. So I also interviewed, thank you, I also interviewed Robert E. Simon. Those of you who don't know, another another book. Did he write a, a Yes, this is the son. But the founder of Reston, R-E-S-T-O-N, is the son. Right, he's the one I interviewed. And he's the one who worked with Senior in real estate. Right. Yeah, I didn't know. Thank you. Now I got it. I didn't. Right. Right. Thank you. No, I. So it, it, it dovetails perfectly with something that Sarah mentioned. Um, Henry Jr. didn't want to go into real estate. So this gentleman you're talking about becomes a surrogate son. And it's Henry Morgenthau and son becomes Henry Morgenthau and company. And it's with Robert Simon, um, who is a nephew, I believe. And so, and while the ambassador, when he becomes the ambassador, and he's there for three years in, um, in Constantinople, now Istanbul, <laughs> uh, this young man takes over the business of the real estate holdings in New York City. Not all, though, as you probably know. Sounds like you're up on this. Uh, Henry Jr.'s real estate, he continued to run himself. There was, there was at least three properties. Um, I don't know when Carnegie Hall falls in, though, but Father Coughlin, it's a great example. I, I don't know the, uh, uh, if I knew it, I've forgotten it. Um, the occasion for that rally, and there was more than one, this is a tradition. It's one of the themes we talked about, going across the aisle. Uh, obviously, someone like Crane or Coughlin, or dare I say, Charles Lindbergh, or Beck Breckenridge Long. These may be odious figures from our history. To the Morgenthaus, they were potential allies. They were people you could do business with. They were, and certainly in this case, Father Coughlin's actually being used, they thought, uh, to come to Roosevelt's side. Quickly, he moved away from it, though. But thank you, yeah. Yes. Um, this is a question for Susan. <laughs> Sarah, did you, what did you find out about your family in this book that you didn't know? <laughs> there were, you know, I, obviously I grew up with this and, and there were many things that I knew, but as I've said to Andrew repeatedly, uh, getting to know him and reading this book uh, really has been just this enormous blessing, and I feel not just on a personal level, um, but that it's for all of us, because we know now with the events that we're dealing with, whether it's, you know, anti-Semitism, whether it's the things that we're seeing in Memphis, um, how important it is to understand who were these people, who were their personalities, how did, how did these things happen? And you know, one example I gave was the relationship between my grandfather uh, and the president, and I always knew that they were close. I mean, that was Eleanor Roosevelt was at my parents' wedding, and I own a necklace of, of um, the First Lady, uh, which is at the, on loan permanently in, in Hyde Park. But I didn't understand really the depth of their relationship, their closeness, the personalities, wh why uh, so much happened and why history was able to happen uh, because of this friendship. And, and I think that that's something that Andrew has done uh, uh, so incredibly, incredibly well for all of us. And you know we need uh, today to to be reminded of this. And and my daughter, I will call out, who's uh, a senior at Columbia and studying uh, history, and uh, is threatening to go to law school and seems to be on that track. 
Um, you know, all of this is important. Um, you know, Andrew told me that Alvin Bragg um, uh, wants him to come in and um, talk about the book and actually give the book, uh, you know, to all of the assistants. So, you know, whether it's talking about the War Refugee Board, uh, the Holocaust, the Armenian Genocide, or, you know, how we started um, uh, going after insider trading and securities fraud and all of the intricacies of the cases, which you do really well, um, uh, during my uncle's tenure um, at the uh, district attorney's office. It's also, um, you know, the history of the law in a way and the history of law in New York. And, and so I learned a heck of a lot. And bravo, Andrew. I did, no, thank you, and I thank you so much. It's beyond kind. And full disclosure, it's my loss. It really is my loss. You said a blessing. Uh, it, what is extraordinary and a really an omission, I interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people. <laughs> I had never interviewed Sarah before. And it's been an incredible discovery. Uh, so you are starting really, I mean, this is for you all, for in the interest of transparency, you're starting from zero just reading this. So it's a great question, thank you. And it's a fascinating question for me, of course, uh, to hear the answer. Um, how history and why history is made, that's pretty, uh, strong words. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Andrew will be outside. We have copies of the book for sale at Visitor Services, and they'll be on our site as well. Um, as Josh mentioned, we hope you'll visit the museum to see the Holocaust, what hate can do alongside uh, survivors, Faces of Life After the Holocaust, photographs by Martin Scholler. Our exhibition, Courage to Act on the Danish Rescue, will be opening in October. And we hope you can also support our work by donating to the museum. Consider joining us as a member and attend our upcoming public programs. Let's give it up one more time. Thank you so much, Andrew Meyer and Sarah Morgenthau.